like to welcome everyone to this uh, session of the COVID-19 and the Law uh, Colloquium Series, which is a series here at Harvard Law School available uh, live in the Harvard community and then recorded, as you just heard, uh, so that we can post it on the website. Uh, Emily Broadlieb and I developed this as a forum for discussion of the many ways in which legal rules and practices are tested and are responding to challenges brought on by the pandemic. We also are eager to examine how the pandemic shines a spotlight on the inequities, frailties, and failures system-wide in legal frameworks and institutions, especially inequities falling hardest on the marginalized communities, notably people of color, who impoverished people. Uh, over the course of this fall, the weekly colloquium uh, involves over 40 members of the Harvard uh, Law School staff and faculty, and uh, we're grateful to John Manning and so many others in the community who are making this possible. Um, the topics range across many, many fields. Today's topic is basic needs uh, and uh, duties. And I, without further ado, will turn it over to David Harris, who will moderate. He's the managing director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice here at Harvard Law School. Uh, and he, in turn, will uh, bring to you the panelists. We have uh, Joe Singer, who's uh, the Bussey Professor of Law. Um, we have Eloise Lawrence, who's clinical professor and uh, also deputy faculty director of the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau. Julie McCormick, who's the director of the Safety Net Project at uh, the Legal Services Center and Emily Broadlieb, Clinical Professor of Law and Faculty Director of the Food Law and Policy Clinic. Thank you, David, so much. Well, thank you so much, Martha, and thank you also, Emily, for the two of you for putting together this fantastic series. I know we all benefit from it and uh, uh, benefit from the law school coming together as a community. Uh, our, our topic today is housing and food law, are two essential elements for overall well-being, but also two areas with persistent disparities that continue to haunt our society. These disparities exacerbate and are exacerbated by the pandemic. As Charles Hamilton Houston insisted, you know, all our struggles must tie in together in the quest for justice, and tying these two topics together is in keeping with uh, his admonition in that regard. We're fortunate to have among our faculty several experts uh, in these areas, faculty whose expertise uh, extends beyond the theoretical to the practical. We're going to have, have our speakers go in the order in which uh, Professor Minow just uh, uh, announced them. Uh, and in the interest of time, we'll just move to that. I have a, a, a framing question I'd like to put to our panelists. Uh, that, that draws from, you know, I've been reflecting recently on the, the Kerner Commission report from over 50 years ago and its previously, its unpublished predecessor, The Harvest of American Racism, which noted the disparities and social determinants of, of health between people of color and white, between the haves and the have nots that continue today despite the findings of that commission that called for comprehensive change and extensive investment to correct and close these gaps. Now, I wonder if we might stipulate that we face two related crises today, uh, COVID-19 and the persistence violence against Black Americans, which continue to reveal the Kerner Commission's concern and fear that we were becoming two societies. Always a peculiar phrase to me since we seem to be two societies to begin with. But uh, I would ask you all to serve as expert witnesses for a 21st century Kerner Commission and let us know what you consider the most pressing and most readily correctable housing and food issues, and which essential short-term fixes in the face of the crises are most important to make permanent. Uh, with that, I turn to you, Professor Singer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about uh, four problems in the housing area. Uh, these have been problems for quite some time, but all of them are far worse now because of COVID-19. First problem um, is that there is simply not enough affordable housing in the United States. It's partly because there's not enough housing, period, at least in the places where people need it. But the affordability of the housing is a particular problem. Second problem is wages in the United States are too low for many, most people. We know this because average families cannot pay for basic necessities. 
much less have a comfortable life. Now problems one and two are linked. A recent report in June of this year by the National Low Income Housing Coalition shows that full-time minimum wage workers cannot afford a two bedroom apartment anywhere in the United States of America. Um, and also they cannot afford even a one bedroom apartment in 95% of US counties. Third problem, both the federal and state governments passed laws and pursued policies over the course of both the 19th and 20th century that denied access to adequate wages and affordable housing for African Americans. Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, published in 2017, puts a lot of information together from uh, prior scholarship, but he adds some new information uh, from his own research. Um, and he details all the ways that the uh, governments um, in the United States have promoted racial segregation and restricted access to housing, employment, and public accommodations on account of race. The U.S. denied minimum wage protections for many African Americans. Um, states and local governments engaged in exclusionary zoning, and they are still doing this. The U.S. denied African Americans access to federally insured mortgages that were made available to white families to buy housing. The U.S. promoted racial segregation in housing by requiring developers to place covenants and deeds that prohibited the sale and occupancy of housing to African Americans. These practices and laws were still in effect at the time of my birth in the middle of the 20th century, um, and some of them are still in effect, and um, these laws still cause harm to racial equity. These historical and current laws have huge impacts today and they go a long way to explaining current racial disparities in wealth and income today. Fourth problem is that evictions are too common and they often deprive tenants of housing even when those tenants would have a legal right to remain under existing property law doctrines. In normal, time, in normal times, evictions impose huge economic and social costs on both landlords and tenants. In the midst of COVID-19, evictions will certainly lead to the spread of the disease. We are most safe as we know when we shelter in place, but that requires us to have a home. It is a real possibility that for some number of human beings, eviction in the midst of a pandemic is a death sentence. And because those evicted will have to go somewhere and will not have stable housing, that increases the risk of spreading COVID-19. That also means that mass evictions at this moment are a public nuisance under longstanding legal definitions of that term. Here's some solutions. Uh, David, you asked me to do some short-term ones. The, the main short-term ones are to um, do what the Congress already did for a couple of months, but it's not doing now. Prop up people's incomes so that they can pay for food and housing in the short term. Um, and also uh, um, have uh, uh, prevent evictions from happening, also foreclosure. But some longer-term um, solutions are these. First, we should recognize that racial disparities in the US are not the result of market forces, but are the direct result of government policy and law. We need to stop being content with policies that look neutral in the abstract. We need laws that are designed to actually redress the racial imbalances that are the present legacy of past and present government practices and laws. That means measuring laws and policies by their impacts on redressing inequalities in income and wealth that are inconsistent with our basic norms of liberty and equality under the law. Second, we should raise both the minimum wage and the earned income tax credit. We should tie those to the local cost of living and we should make raises in those automatic over time. Third, we need to reform our caretaking economy. Those who care for children and the elderly often perform these services without any financial remuneration at all. And those who do this for a living do not earn enough. We need to ensure that caretakers and those they care for are healthy, happy, and able to live in dignity. I think we should have federal funding for these basic services rather than leaving them to the families that don't have adequate income. Fourth, we should fully fund Section 8 housing vouchers. Right now, only 75%, three quarters, um, uh, right now, three quarters of the people who qualify for housing vouchers um, cannot get them because there's inadequate federal funding. Um, we should pass a federal law also that prohibits landlords from discriminating against housing voucher recipients. Fifth, we should reform zoning laws so that towns can no longer engage in, ex in exclusionary zoning and so they can no longer exclude affordable housing. 
we should prohibit towns from passing zoning laws that do not allow multifamily housing anywhere in the municipality. Sixth, we should reform eviction laws and mortgage laws. Um, I think we should make sure that every tenant is represented by a competent attorney. I think that we, would, we should mandate mediation before eviction. Um, and I think eviction should be tied to government services that ensure that tenants who are evicted do not become homeless. I think we also need to regulate installment land contracts that have replaced subprime mortgages um, and are a particular problem for black and Latino home buyers today. Finally, just to, to summarize, um, we need to take a systemic approach to housing protection in the midst of this pandemic. I've seen a lot of commentaries that focus on protecting tenants or protecting landlords or protecting banks. We cannot look at this from the standpoint of only one of the actors. Each of the actors has a role to perform in the housing economy. <coughs> we need, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we need to recognize Excuse me. We need to recognize that most landlords of poor tenants are also poor uh, and don't have sufficient resources to pay for repairs. No rent to those landlords means those landlords can lose their properties by foreclosure. And that means a loss of affordable housing that will not be replaced. Um, we did this for a few months um, of supporting people so they can pay their rents and so the landlords can pay their mortgages, but we've stopped doing that. We have a limit on evictions right now that was promulgated by the CDC. It's not clear um, there's going to be some challenges to the legal authority to do that, uh, but we are not actually helping people make people make rental payments. Um, and the evictions are happening, many of them in an illegal manner. Um, so that's another, another huge problem we're facing right now. So. Thank you, Joe. That's a lot. <laughs> you, that's a lot. So uh, I want to interrupt briefly to remind the audience and let the audience know that we will take your questions. We ask you to put them in the uh, Q and A for us, and we'll try to uh, to get back to them as ma as many as we can. Eloise. Sure. Well, Professor Singer just did a beautiful job of summarizing an entire area of law, and so I'm going to come at it from a very different perspective as. Um, while I teach and uh, work at Harvard and love doing so, I am at the core a legal aid lawyer and uh, represent people uh, who are getting evicted. So I wanna answer the question, starting with a moment in time. I wanna start on the morning of Thursday, March 12th, 2020. I was headed to the Edward Brooks Courthouse in downtown Boston. Many of you may remember where you were. It was two days after Governor Baker declared a state of emergency and Harvard had told all the uh, students that the university was going remote and they would need to leave campus. Thursdays uh, are eviction day in Eastern Housing Court and the Massachusetts court system had given no indication that they were going to shut down despite the governor's pronouncement. As a result, some of the most vulnerable residents in the city were being ordered to court, often traveling by public transportation, to congregate in a crowded courthouse. Now it's important at this moment for me to step back and set the scene of a typical Thursday morning in housing court. As soon as the doors open at eight o'clock, there's a line up the door of tenants waiting to go through metal detectors. These tenants are predominantly black and brown people and they're often waiting outside in the cold and rain just to enter the building. Lawyers are like myself are allowed to flash their bar card, skip the metal detectors and escape into the warmth of the building. These lawyers are overwhelmingly white once upstairs on the fifth floor, the housing court courtrooms are filled to capacity, once again with black and brown people who are often crammed into the galleries and, and squeezed into wherever they are permitted to put their bodies. And they're often disabled, elderly, and very young. Um, the mostly white, able-bodied lawyers sit comfortably in the jury box waiting for the clerk to call the names of the cases. And on average, 200 eviction cases will be on the list and some tenants will wait hours for their case to be called. So let me return to that March 12th morning. The courts were insisting that the housing court remain open and that the evictions proceed as normal. I, along with my colleagues at the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau and Greater Boston Legal Services, 
joined our partners at uh, City Life Vita Urbana, a grassroots housing justice organization, at a protest in front of the court to shut it down. We understood the irony of having to come together to make the point to stay at home and to stay safe, but it was critical to highlight the absurdity of what was happening. After the protest, I went inside to oversee the attorney of the day table, which is often staffed by Harvard Legal Aid Bureau and the Wilmer Hale Legal Services Center with the lawyers, um, uh, clinical instructors, and clinic students. Because the students were facing a housing crisis of their own, given Harvard's announcement, it was only a few staff members and myself who were there able to handle the hundreds of unrepresented tenants. And as Professor Singer uh, noted, most tenants are unrepresented. In fact, it's around 90%, whereas most lawyers are overwhelmingly represented. On that day, who I get were no longer uh, um, able to go into the courtroom were jammed into the hallways awaiting direction as to where to go um, and I in the midst of trying to assist as many people as could I filed a motion to continue a trial for a particular client that was scheduled that next week it was a case with a pregnant woman who was suffering abuse from her boyfriend and was unable to work because of the complications from pregnancy. She was having twins. She was being evicted for non-payment of rent. I filed a motion asking the court to postpone her trial due to the heightened risk she faced if they were, she were to contact the virus, contact the virus. The housing court swiftly denied my motion saying that there was no nexus between my client's disability, her pregnancy, and complications from corona, and that the state of emergency had not closed the door. Needless to say, I was angry, uh, more than a little so. And, but my outrage and my efforts to use my tools as a lawyer were shown to be deeply ineffective at that moment. But what was effective was the media attention and accompanying public pressure on the court system to shut it down. Less than 48 hours after the protest and letters and calls, letters, um, some organized by the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau students getting public health officials to write in the courts were temporarily closed. But the filings of the eviction cases continued until the legislature finally passed an eviction moratorium in April, one of the strongest in the nation that was still in effect. This, this moratorium temporarily gave my client respite, but the effects of the stress of the eviction were significant. Well, I cannot say in her case whether this stress was the cause of her preterm labor and the resulting disability of one of her twins, I do know that medical studies have shown that eviction does correlate with preterm births and other complications in pregnancy, along with a host of other medical infirmities. She was, however, able to remain in her apartment until she could find another place to live. But her landlord is insisting on pursuing her for unpaid rent, which may not result in money for the landlord, but will surely destroy this woman's credit and her ability to find housing in the future. But let's focus on the positives of the moratorium for a second, because it is an example of how the law can protect our most marginalized communities when we find the collective will. The moratorium has forced the number of eviction filings to drop from hundreds every week to a small handful. Furthermore, the state moratoria and now the national moratorium issued by the CDC recognize a fundamental truth, and that is we all lose from evictions that we are all affected if people are dis dislocated and forced into overcrowded housing and homeless shelters because we are all connected to each other. So my hope is that COVID has shown us that we can have a housing system that does not accept evictions as a central feature. I have already seen that when eviction is taken off the table, I have, um, because I've had tenants who landlords before the moratorium refused to negotiate uh, but now that the moratorium is in effect and eviction is no longer possible, they have created workable payment plans and behavioral agreements that have allowed my clients to stay. So I will, I'm going on a, a bit too long, but I just want to say fi my final point, getting back to what David uh, asked us in terms of the, the twin crises that we're in, it's important to understand the racial implications of eviction because they are not felt equally among poor people. And it's important to understand the research that is showing us that racial discrimination is not just a thing of the past,
but that in fact evictions are the number one predictor of who is going to get evicted in the neighborhood is not re income rental burden or other economic factors but it's the number of black renters so we need to have end evictions for all the reasons uh, that I have pointed out, but most importantly, I think in this moment, because of the racial injustice that it perpetuates. Thank you. Thank you, Eloise. Julie? Thank you so much. Um, and I do, I really appreciate both uh, Professor Singer and uh, uh, Professor Lawrence setting, starting us out in this way. I think that the, the kinds of policies that Professor Singer outlined absolutely set us up for the situation that we're in right now where folks are having to choose what they're spending, what little amount of money that they have. Um, they're choosing how to spend it. And with housing costs the way they are, um, other things don't get, uh, there's, no, there's no money for them. And so as I was thinking about the way in which um, COVID is directly impacting the work that we do uh, over the Legal Services Center, working with folks, um, it, and I was thinking through the kinds of things that I wanted to talk about today, I really wanted to make um, strongly the point that people are going hungry. Um, the uh, food insecurity is defined as a lack of consistent access to enough food to live an active and healthy life. And I think that we sometimes forget what that might look like. Um, if you haven't known hunger, um, it's really hard to, to extrapolate from those sort of very dry intellectual words into what that looks like for clients. Um, and again, I think that is important for us, for all of us to keep those clients in mind. And I wanna talk about um, two of my clients, um, in addition to doing the public benefits work, we do a lot of work with folks who are applying for social security disability benefits, which is the only alternative that people have in this country for income if they can't work to support themselves. They have to get social security benefits. And so I wanna talk about uh, two of my clients, one of whom I'm going to call Hope. Um, and she is a domestic violence survivor. Um, she's a single mom. And uh, for a while, she was able to work enough to buy a modest house in a predominantly black neighborhood in Boston. So she has a home, she's sheltered, and she's being protected by the um, foreclosure um, forbearance right now. Um, she is disabled. Um, she has a, a whole cluster of impairments. Uh, she has asthma, um, a, a condition that she's had since, child, since childhood. Um, she has fibromyalgia, she has arthritis. Despite this, that she has been uh, working to support herself. What's she been doing? She's been running a daycare out of her home. Um, well, we know what happened with um, daycares. We know what happened with uh, stay-at-home orders. And so she has had zero income for an extended period of time. What has been the replacement for her earned income, um, meager as it was? Well, she got the $1,200 that we all got, right, for the, um, the stimulus payment. She's gotten, she has gotten uh, expedited access to SNAP assistance. Um, food stamps, and so she receives the maximum amount of SNAP payments, which is $194 per month for her as a single person, um, a little bit more considering her um, daughter, and um, she has received um, pandemic unemployment assistance. Um, it's not nearly enough to cover her mortgage. It's not nearly enough to cover her disability-related expenses. It's not nearly enough to cover the kinds of healthy food that she needs in order to um, increase her chances of continuing to be active. And again, we keep in, uh, some of the policies that uh, Professor Singer outlined um, directly impact where she was able to buy her home and what she has access to. So she doesn't have ready access to a supermarket um, where she can consistently get the food that she needs, the healthy food. She doesn't have easy access to a farmer's market. She doesn't have, uh, she has to use public transportation. As a person who is at a higher risk because of her respiratory disorders and her other conditions, that's not something that she has been willing to do. And so what has she done? Um, she has managed, um, she's still alive. Um, she's still waiting for a social security hearing. All of those have been shut down. Um, they're only offering telephonic hearings. So she now has to make a decision about how it is she's going to proceed with that. Um, knowing that again, the deck is somewhat stacked against her. Um, given her age, given her impairments, given how the hearing is going to happen. Um, she also, her daughter, uh, because she's still in school, they, she received pandemic EBT benefits. So every child um, who was eligible for um, free food, free lunch through the school received the pandemic EBT. That ended up being about $5.70 $5 per day that was mailed to, to folks. 
my client actually got that. She got that mail to her. Many of my clients did not receive it. They, that didn't come. As meager as that was, they didn't even get that. Um, and that is one of the things that, uh, again, we, we've seen in this response. So there has been some pretty effective response from um, the, tr the Department of Transitional Assistance in responding to this extreme um, spike in food insecurity. I want to underscore here that food insecurity is not new, right? So this is a chronic condition. We have people in our country who go without food um, consistently. The only thing that's changed now is that COVID has uh, doubled the number of people who are food insecure and frankly has made those folks, um, th those are the folks who are in our own neighborhoods, right? So we see our own neighbors struggling. Um, before this, it was folks that we saw because we were working with uh, these clients and in these neighborhoods, but mo most Americans didn't see. Um, and so again, just underscoring that point, food insecurity is not new. We feel like it's an acute crisis now. And in response to that acute crisis, we've done a couple of different things. We've waived in-person um, uh, appointments. Um, we've, we've, we've lifted some of the restrictions on verification. Um, we've uh, eased some of these rules that look neutral on their face, but which operate to make sure that only deserving people get the benefits that we're providing. And frankly, that ends up being, um, a, the, there end up being race-based consequences to that. And so we're making sure that those deserving people um, often are the folks who look the most like us or the most like the people who are making decisions about access. The other person I wanna talk about um, here is, um, so Hope is a homeowner. I, we, I have no idea um, how we're gonna marshal the resources for her to keep her home once um, foreclosures are back in play. I have no idea how I'm going to help her using the legal tools that I have. And again, I think Eloise, um, uh, Professor Lawrence made a really great point about the, the tools that we have to us as lawyers. Um, in the short term, they're quite limited. Um, I have no idea. The other client I wanna talk about is Stan. And Stan is a veteran in his late uh, 50s. And he was homeless because of his, um, his PTSD, his alcohol um, dependence. He was homeless until very recently. And thankfully he got housed but he got housed in a community 70 miles away from where his support systems are. He got housed in a community where there isn't a support structure in place for him. Um, he got housed after being homeless for about five years. Um, he didn't know how to grocery shop. He didn't know how to figure out how to get the food together or the transportation together to get groceries. And that stress, I, was, I just talked to him earlier this week and I am just, I'm crushed to know that he's relapsed. So he had been clean, he had been sober, he's relapsed. Um, and so again, I don't know what I'm going to do to be able to help him. Um, uh, what I do know is that I'm going to be relying upon the resources that we've gathered at the Legal Services Center and in collaboration with other partners to try to pull it together. But there isn't a legal response here. This is a social crisis. Um, and uh, finally, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the things that I think need to happen. So number one, I think there's an entire industry um, of folks that we litigate against, right? Who are in place to make sure that, again, only deserving folks get the SNAP assistance or get the disability benefits or get the housing subsidies or get whatever it is we're doling out, um, but to make sure only the deserving folks get those. Some of the eases, e easing that we've done of the restrictions in people's access to those programs need to become permanent. Um, they really were, again, as Professor Singer says, they look neutral, but they operate in a very racially disparate, uh, disparate fashion. Lifting, making it easier to verify the information that's required to figure out the exact amount that somebody um, should be getting. Lifting asset caps, um, caps that were put in place 50 to 60 to 70 years ago that really don't make sense now in the context of folks paying 50% or more of their income on housing. Um, look at consolidating applications. Like we know in Massachusetts, we have healthcare access, uh, which for as long as it lasts, right, is pretty good right now. Um, and so why don't we consolidate those applications and make them easier for folks to get not just the health insurance, but the other benefits that they're financially el eligible for. Um, there are more and many of the proposals that Professor Singer outlined are really gonna fix some of these issues, right? Because the issue is not uh, a, a lack of food. The issue is a lack of income. The issue is a lack of access to affordable housing, access to place to safe, secure places to live. The, it, the issue is really that not everywhere in America looks like the suburbs, and it could if we put together the um, appropriate kinds of uh, federal policies to actually help people 
prevent people being in a situation where they're hungry and they don't know where the next meal is coming from and they frankly don't know how long they're going to be able to live where they are. So, thank you. Thank you, Joy. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I want to just, before I start, just thank all the speakers again and the speakers that are participating throughout this series. It's been so amazing to, you know, and a nice way to really um, pull forward the expertise we have amongst our own um, community. So I'm going to sort of take where Julie left off and zoom out a little bit from there. So my work in the Food Law and Policy Clinic is looking at the laws and policies that structure the food system and the outbreak of COVID-19 and resulting shutdowns and economic downturn have caused this a major upheaval in all aspects of that, um, particularly as they impact marginalized populations. So I've been seeing these issues span across four major buckets. The first is, as you just heard from Julie, about rising food insecurity. Um, so as she, as she explained, food insecurity has more than doubled since the outbreak of COVID. That's people who are, um, lack consistent access to enough food for an active healthy life, but even more concerning the number of people suffering from very low food security, meaning that they actually right now are not able to eat enough, has increased from 4% before COVID to 11% right now. And this is much higher in communities of color in black and Latinx communities. So in normal times, those, those communities are two times as food insecure as white communities and right now, approximately one in five Black and Latinx adults report that they do not have enough to eat today. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to that, but second category has been around food workers. Um, so workers across the food supply live at the margins already. Restaurant workers also have double the rate of food insecurity of, of other households. And workers across the food chain work at hourly rates. They do not receive health care. They often suffer from wage theft and terrible working conditions, unsafe working condi conditions, and other issues. Um, yet, as states and localities shut down across the country, these workers' jobs were declared essential, and they were forced to continue working in farms, in fields, in food processing plants, and meatpacking plants, and in grocery stores. So as a result of that, according to data collected by the Food and Environment Reporting Network, as of yesterday, at least 59,497 food system workers, especially meatpacking workers, have tested positive for COVID. At least 254 of these workers have died. Uh, this is just unconscionable. Um, so next issue we're seeing is in terms of food waste. Even before the pandemic, we were wasting nearly 40% of the food produced in this country. And this is about 18% of our cropland and 20% of our water goes to water crops that we just essentially throw in the trash, which is terrible for the environment. And then food is the single largest item by volume in our landfills and emits 15% of our methane emissions. Um, so things just got much worse in this pandemic as we were not able to quickly move food from one supply chain to another. Potatoes meant for cruise ships were left to rot milk bound for hotels was dumped into ditches and eggs that were meant for restaurants were sent to the landfill. Despite the numbers we just heard about how many people already were suffering from hunger and food insecurity. And this leads to the last category, which is farmers. And um, farmers already are subject to some of the most economically risky jobs and the supports that we have that exist for most of the largest food and agribusinesses don't really help farmers, especially small farmers or local and regional farmers. They're really one paycheck away from bankruptcy. Um, in particular, studies found that local and regional farmers stood to lose about $1 billion in sales. And these are the very farmers who were not helped by the um, programs that Congress authorized and USDA implemented. Um, and we also have a horrible, horrible history of discrimination in our government agencies against Black and other farmers of color. Black farmers lost 90% of the land that they owned in this country between 1910 and 1997, and white farmers in that same time period lost 2%. Today, white farmers control 98% of privately owned land and receive 97.8% of all government payments. So just briefly, what's been the response? I mean, this is a crisis. We are having a crisis across every aspect of food. In terms of food insecurity, as you heard from Julie, there have been some changes, some waivers, um, and I think Julie put it well when she said these have been really to help those who are the deserving people, keeping in place a lot of limitations and caps that 
are very outdated and really don't help make sure that people actually have enough money to buy the food they need to eat. In terms of food workers, the president used his power under the Defense Production Act to give USDA the authority to keep meat processing plants open and the food supply running. But this was just about consumers and it was not about keeping workers safe in any way. And in fact, if it had been about keeping workers safe, he could have instead given that authority to the Department of Labor and the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, to say, you need to keep workers safe so that we're able to keep producing food. Um, despite all the illnesses, it wasn't until this month that OSHA issued its first citations to any meat processing plants. And it was just, I think last week, to a plant, Smithfield plant in South Dakota and a JBS plant in Colorado. And the Smithfield plant was only for $13,000, despite the fact that 300 of their workers got ill, contracted the virus, and four died. Um, and then in terms of farmers, Congress passed and USDA implemented the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, which includes both direct payments to farmers and then a program called the Farmers to Families Food Box Program. So just taking the direct payments, there's no full data yet, but recent pre-COVID farmer assistance programs have shown, have raised equity, real equity concerns. So the market facilitation program, which was giving money to farmers and ranchers that were harmed by retaliatory tariffs over the last few years. Um, research uncovered that the program disproportionately supported large agricultural enterprises and um, those with white owners. So actually research by one of our alumni, Nate Rosenberg, found that 99.4% of those trade aid payments to farmers uh, went to white owners um, and 91% went to male business owners. And by, in the total, the top 20% of recipients received 75% of the program's payments. Um, so just in, you know, I think in closing, and, and I will maybe come back in some of the Q&A to some of my suggestions, but um, uh, why is this happening? I mean, these are not discrete issues. They're all part of the way that we produce, distribute, and sell food in this country. Um, part of it is that there's no systemic approach to food. There's no food agency. Um, the regulation of the food system is actually divided across 15 different federal agencies. So it's really hard to hold someone accountable. And they're completely uncoordinated. We have no plan, we have no strategy for how these agencies should work together or for what our goals are. As noted above, discrimination and inequality are baked into the system. And poor payment and no paid leave for workers in the food system keep prices down to some extent, but means that most workers in the food system are themselves food insecure and are the biggest recipients of federal aid and food assistance payments. Um, so I'll stop there. I could go on, but I know that there's a lot to explore the intersections of these. And maybe I'll say too, for those, um, as a reminder to ask in the Q&A, uh, if you have questions and I'll, I'll turn it back to David. Thank you, Emily, and thank you everybody. It's, <clears throat> it's certainly a lot to think about and, 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 and you know, I know that that, that all of you have more to say, and uh, it's difficult for me to think about how to how to tease it out of you. Um, and 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 let me say that I, I certainly hope that people will continue to follow through this um, seminar. That you know, on, you know, on the website and looking at the materials that continue to be posted. Um, you know, there, you know, the, the two questions that come to mind for me. I'd like to have you all talk to each other, and I don't know if you all had questions for each other, but. There, you know, there are there are these two dimensions really. I mean, there's this very practical dimension that, that Julie and Eloise raise in terms of clients and people that they work with, and 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 kind of how this is impacted. You know, I wrote down some notes. You know, at one point Julie said of one of her clients that she was still alive. You know, which is, you know, which is a, you know, I mean, that's great. You know, given given where we are, but. But you know, we think about quality of life, and um, and and I so I wonder how we think about serving the interests of individual clients and larger legal questions, right? And and so part you know, and one of the things that comes out of that is the the focus. Where should our focus be? You know, national, state, local. You know, Eloise talked about you know our state eviction. You know, you know. Law basically winding up being replicated later by the feds. So, so I wonder if, if you could talk about that a little bit and or, but 
I'll be true to my word, if you have questions for one another, pose those questions now and, and or talk about these, the, the kind of organizing and local uh, uh, individual versus uh, structural and, uh, and the focus, the locus of our efforts. Anybody? Can you hear me, David? Oh, go ahead, Julie. No, I, I'm just thinking about, I mean, that is the big question, right? And so that is, that is the question that we're presented with, those, those of us who are doing direct legal service, right? And so that's why these conversations are so important because you can, you can only do so much um, when, you're direct, when you're working individually one client at a time. And again, as, as, as you know, Gary Bellow's model, right? And so we do a lot of direct service. We do a lot of individual work. We do the best that we can in the communities that we're working to push the envelope, to push the, the laws. And by doing that, we really highlight the flaws. And I just want to be really clear about, you know, some of the, some of the things that are happening um, with SNAP and with, um, with these, some of these so-called entitlement programs are really just sort of um, tinkering around the edges, right? And so there's really no big thinking that's happening in response to this. And I think that the point that, um, that Eloise, the Professor Lawrence was making about the impact of organizing and about the outrage. I mean, why aren't we outraged that people are going hungry? Why aren't we outraged that those folks that we consider essential workers in the food plants and in the grocery stores, why aren't we out, and now our teachers, right? Why aren't we outraged, outraged that people are dying? Um, uh, we really actually need more than, more than just this response of tinkering around the edges with some of these programs. And I think maybe that outrage will fuel the change that we identify right across the law school in, in the housing context, in the food context, in, some of the, in, in all of the places that we work. I'm hopeful that, that, that there will be some outrage and there will be some response um, that, that creates a legislative fix, right? So we, we know from the stories what needs to be fixed. Let's take that and make some legislative fix it. Have a bit of big thinking around some of the ways in which we can really improve this. And again, going back to the Kerner Commission, right? We've had a prescription for 50 plus years. Let's, let's see if we can actually do something with that um, and with the information that we have now. And I, I wanna say that the uh, stories that Eloise and Julie told to me are part of the um, solution because I think part of what is going on is that um, uh, people that um, are, are very worried about themselves um, and it's hard to see the situation of other people um, and people that are all, that are okay, um, find it hard to um, realize that other people didn't make any mistakes, they did nothing wrong and it's not their fault, but they're not okay. And I think um, actually helping people understand that people are in this situation not because they've done anything wrong. And also to see the people that are, that are hurting as human beings. I think we need sort of a moral reframing of um, seeing people that are the victims of economic circumstance um, to be not um, uh, sort of being punished for private failings, uh, but because of defects in our system. So we need to see people as human beings. And we need also to realize that they're but for the grace of God. So the idea that somehow this is happening to other people, but not to me. Well, the one thing we should be actually getting as a moral lesson, if God was talking to us, um, this could happen to any of us. And the idea of not having enough food or not having safe housing, this is not something that just happens to other people. And so I think the, the stories that you're telling are part of the, you know, one of the main things that can happen is to try and reframe things so that people realize um, this could happen to any of us and the people that it's happening to are human beings and we should care about each other. Um, people hear lessons uh, when they go to religious services about caring for the stranger and the sick and the orphan. And we should not forget about those lessons when we're thinking about <clears throat> what the law should be it's perfectly possible for us to come up with policies that will help people and avoid um, harm. I think, you know, a major thing we need to do is actually to realize um, that we have a moral obligation to do this. And again, those stories about recognizing that um, we are in this together and that we have a duty to care for each other 
um, and that um, we care for other people because we would want to be taken care of ourselves. And we are all vulnerable, every single one of us. COVID teaches us that every single one of us could be in a position where we're insecure with housing or food. And so this is not just about um, uh, being altruistic. This is actually a matter of self-interest that we should see that everyone um, needs, um, we need different laws and approaches that would actually help people in these situations. Um, so one of the um, questions in the Q&A was about what to do about the fact that people are racking up rent that they can't pay. And then when the moratoria go off, people will be evicted um, and lose their houses to foreclosure. Um, and again, I do think that uh, if we had a rational government, um, we would all be pitching in to actually uh, make sure that those payments are happening because the costs of allowing people to be evicted um, or lose their homes for, to foreclosure are going to reverberate um, and come back to haunt all of us. Um, it'll be far less costly if you were just totally interested in nothing but economics. It would be less costly to pay everyone's rent for two years in the United States than it would be to um, allow people to be evicted and then clean up the mess. Can I uh, just build on your point, Joe? Because I think, you know, also building on one of the issues for each of the individual cases is really seeing how these relate. And I think it's part of the idea of bringing these two topics together that we're, it's, it's the same people who are food insecure and housing insecure and kind of struggling with these, with these challenges. And I think the fight is really, you know, making sure we have support for individual clients, but then also taking a step back to say, you know, this isn't, these aren't one-off issues. This is, these are systemic challenges. I think one of the other things that I'm really concerned about is just we already were in such an unequal society. And as David mentioned, this two societies we were becoming or already were, um, but it's getting so much worse. And I think, you know, some of the points that I made and what we're seeing in the food system is even where um, funds are being diverted ends up pooling in the largest businesses and those who already have those resources. And I think at the end of this, the consolidation and the inequality is going to be so much worse. And again, these are all things we can change. We have the tools. Our students that are watching today, you have the tools. It's just about knowing that these problems are out there and you know, taking the time to figure out what are the ways to use the tools that we have. Um, so I don't know, I wanna let Eloise um, squeeze in a comment too before maybe we get to some of the questions. Sure. Um, oh, um, well, a couple of things. One, just the idea of direct services um, to those, those are considering direct services and trying to tackle these big problems. As, as Julie mentioned, Gary Bello being um, a, a father of this, but the concept of a case to cause, the idea that you can use individual cases to push these bigger issues. And partly that is effective for the reasons that Professor Singer just described is that ultimately people respond to stories, people respond to narrative, people respond to other humans. I fundamentally believe that we are good and, and that other humans will take care of other humans, but they need to make, they need to feel the connection. They need to understand that this person is like me. And um, we do that through story. And so making sure that it's really important to ground yourself. And that's why I hope that I never get away from actually serving my clients in the sense because they ground me in this work. And it is incredibly effective when you go to a legislator or when you tell a story or you go to the press, you have real people that you can talk about. And that that not as just as a useful tool, but in fact, you are helping that person tell their story and work with other people to create collective action. Because ultimately, lawyers are just lawyers. We are just sort of other actors in the system, but we are not the power. The power comes from the collective action. So, uh, you know, I, I just feel strongly that we always go back and use people to help other people um, and, and that it isn't just about what we lawyers can extract. So, that's my Thank you. Yeah. So, so I do want to kind of get to the, the, the audience question. I, I want to make one small editorial comment here as well, though. Uh, and, and that is, you know, it's interesting, I'm, you know, you said there's no system for dealing with this stuff. But I do want us to understand that the stuff we're dealing with is uh, systemic racism. <laughs> so there is a system for that. 
uh, and 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 it does cut across these dimensions of you know of, of all of the stories that we are talking about. There's this question. Of, there's this question of racial disparities that undercuts it. And one thing I wonder about is, you know, we're supposed to be in this special moment with these two crises are meeting and, and there's a different uh, uh, willingness to listen to voices and hear different kinds of stories. And I'm, I'm wondering what you think about, um, you know, kind of the, the impact of that on, on developing the collective will that some of you have talked about to address these systemic issues, right? So the question is, are the stories of, of uh, you know, you know, you know, Emily, the stat you you mentioned about black farmers, right? I mean, it's 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 it's, it's you know, it's it's been known for a while, but it's it's terrible. And um, and Julie, the stories you mentioned about you know not having food, fresh food available, uh, you know, these are. I, I, I mean, I'm wondering if if you might comment a little bit about the intersection between the virus. And, and, and the responses we see or don't see to uh, the violence against black bodies by police. I mean, I don't know if, if you all feel comfortable, but I, I'd be curious what you might have to say about that. And if not, we'll go to see if there are any other questions from the audience. Um, and, you know, there, there was one, so, um, David, I'll, I'll give like a quick response, maybe if you, if I know, I, I want to make sure we get in the questions from them. But just on that point, I think you're, you know, I, I agree completely. There's a system in place that is discriminatory in all the ways that you mentioned that we've brought up. I think my hope is, is at least what I'm seeing from the food side that we're um, making these connections more and more people are, are kind of being educated about the fact that these are related and they're not um, so it's systemic in the way that you said, we don't have necessarily in food or in housing for that matter. I mean, the responses are so piecemeal. Um, I mean, I think one thing we've worked on is having some sort of national food strategy. And part of the idea behind that is to open it up to the public more so that it's not decisions being made off somewhere, you know, in, in some government agency that people don't even realize the impact it's going to have on food or basic needs, but actually having more of a national dialogue about what we want the food system to do and how can it be both, you know, eliminate all these externalities on workers and on the environment, et cetera, but still be affordable and or that people are, you know, have enough income that they're able to purchase it. So I think your question is like the $50 million question, which is we need to, these are things we need to answer. We can't go on with things as the way they are. My only hope is that maybe by, maybe this, um, virus has made some of these things more visible to more people to allow them to engage in a dialogue that otherwise was sort of not in their own, you know, in their own backyard or their own grocery store or their own neighborhood. Thanks. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it overcomes Joel's, Joe's question about kind of if they don't feel it, it doesn't, they don't recognize it, it's not them. And I think you're right that it does. Uh, and maybe the mobilization that's going on helps on that. Uh, let's see. So the questions, we have a couple of questions. Um, So, uh, uh, so uh, to you, Emily, uh, you know, you mentioned we have the tools to tackle the deepening inequalities we're seeing in food, housing, and security. I'm wondering how these tools might be different or adapt to today's political climate of special interests dominating federal government action. Um, you know, and, and again, I, you know, I, I don't know if anybody could weigh in on that. Um, anybody yeah, have thoughts? Yeah, please. I mean, I, I, again, it's, it's, you know, I think it's, it's very clear in the food system and just from the example of the way that um, the response to keeping the food supply open, which really benefited the biggest corporations and not the bodies and lives that were on the line. Um, but I don't know if anyone has, you know, anyone else have a thought on how we get beyond the special interests. Well, I, I, uh, I have, once again, I think we have to hold individuals responsible for their roles in the system, in the systems. Um, I mean, Joe mentioned earlier, for example, all the ways in which our laws and our have, have oppressed black people in the, in the housing system and, and perpetuated um, segregation and injustice there. But I am really struck by how, um, say in the eviction space, how blacks, people are not only more likely to be hauled to court, but the 
deals that they get with landlords are much harsher, which suggests that the land that the lawyers who are engaging in that are being discriminatory and we need to, to hold those individuals accountable. They are usually acting on behalf of companies, but companies are nothing but conglomerations of people. And so it's very easy to rail against these big corporations and say corporates, corporations are the problem, but they, they're the problem because of the way people um, act um, for those companies. So I, I just, I feel like individual responsibility is not gonna solve the problem, but it, to me, it is part of the picture. Thank you, Eloise. Joe, did you have something on that? I was just going to say, you know, that's a very tough question, uh, but I do think people have power, right? I think, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement has had a real effect. I mean, it, it just, it has. It's, you know, it may be a long time till we fix things the way we want, but it has had an impact. Um, and I think its impact will be lasting. And I, you know, I think if political organizing um, and demonstrations and campaigns of contacting uh, political representatives, um, people that are elected want to get reelected um, and public opinion does still matter. Um, so I, I do agree that there are huge barriers to changing the law, um, but I also do think um, the American people are, are not without power. Can I add one point on to, sorry, David, but just on, on all, you know, kind of, it's sort of a call to action also to our students and our community that for every one of these, these, you know, clients that are getting amazing representation from Eloise and Julie and, and our other colleagues in the clinics and students, there's hundreds that don't have that. And I think that having that representation in court, um, in the policy arena on these issues, those but the corporations, bigger companies, like they can afford that. They have an army of lawyers working for them, but we each have the power also as individuals to, you know, we have the skills, we have the connections and the network to really advocate for these causes. So I think it's, it to me now more important than ever that that's where we put our energy because um, otherwise the, you know, David versus Goliath, Goliath is always gonna win. So that's, I mean, that seems like a perfect note on which to end. I think it's a call for movement lawyering and we should all be, <laughs> it should be at the top of our list. And, uh, you know, and I, I'm deeply appreciative to all of you for, the, for, the, for both the work you do on a regular basis and, and for the insights you provided uh, today. It's, uh, it's really a, a fantastic opportunity, again, for, for the law school to, to come together and to think collectively and, you know, in a way to get some marching orders. I mean, I think, you know, we, we, we have work to do and, and we are here to, to marshal the tools that we have uh, towards some good end. Uh, and so with that, in the interest of allowing some of you to get to class, uh, I think we're going to call it a wrap and uh, encourage you to uh, make sure that you participate uh, in, in the remaining uh, sessions, which run how long, how much longer, uh, Emily? And uh, through the second to last week of the semester. Okay, so uh, again, I wanna thank uh, 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 Martha Minow and Emily and, and Dean Manning for, for making this happen and wish everybody uh, a good day and thank you again. With that, I think we're gonna sign off. <laughs>